from Brother Durin, care of the Owl Bear's Head, Dunhill, to the Reverend Mother Wharton, Order of St. Gwenta, the Western Wind Monastery, City of Greyhawk. Reverend Mother, I hope this letter finds you in good health and high spirits. I am pleased to report that my pilgrimage has already yielded a sign of our faith. The young Hin gentleman who delivered this message to you is one Balmo Barleywain, son of Balron Barleywain, and until recently, heir apparent to the Barleywain Brewery. You may recall the cask of their Greenfields Amber, which I procured for last year's full summer festival. Reverend Mother, I suspect this lad may be an embodiment of the saint herself. Of course, I hesitate to judge the signs on my own, so I have sent him on to you. Whether chosen or no, he is prepared to join our sacred family at the Western Wind, and with our charity and guidance, I think he may find salvation. I am aware that he is not an obvious candidate for monastic life, let alone sainthood. He is in truth a rough sort, more interested in the consumption of beer than its production, and in fact, I first saw him in the midst of a brawl over the affections of a barmaid. I should say the lad was properly trounced, but as his rival, one Rowan Oatcastle, turned to slip behind the bar and claim his prize, young Balmo regained his feet and seized up the nearest bludgeons to hand. Reverend Mother, I swear this on my heart and on my brew, this boy, who has never heard the tale of St. Winter in his life, took up a tap-handle and a beer-stein and rejoined the fray, the very implements that most reverend Winter Brunel raised in defence of St. Cuthbert on the day she became a martyr. I believe in the very roots of my soul that she was there in the room with us. Unfortunately, the events here took a rather dark turn, as Rowan slipped in some spilled beer, cracked his head, and perished, and the lad's father, coincidentally the sheriff of Dunhill, swore he would see Balmo hang for the crime of murder. It was at this point I felt compelled to intervene, appealing to the sheriff for Balmo's release into the protection and service of our order. Balmo, for his part, has agreed to apply his brewing skills in service of the western wind, and he is aware that he must give up his family name and inheritance. But, if it means escaping the noose, and perhaps an eternity in the abyss, he has promised me he is willing to devote his life to our happy hostel. I pray that my act of charity and faith has not been ill-placed, and that the lad has indeed come to you rather than disappear into the wide world, as he very easily could. Therefore, if you are reading this, you may take it as proof of his honest character. Until I return, stay thirsty, my friend. Brother Durin In the city of Greyhawk, five individuals are united by circumstance. A brewer priest, a haunted swordsman, a living relic, a caustic criminal, and a golem without a past. With the drawing of a single card, their lives have been turned upside down. Welcome to the Chimera, a role-playing adventure podcast. Our campaign this season is called Misplaced. It takes place in the venerable setting of Greyhawk, kind of and we're playing with a modified version of 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons. I'm Vin LeBate, and I play Golden Eye Rakashi, a dragonborn rogue. Joining me today are... I'm Braden Lamb, and I'm playing Balmo, a halfling cleric. I'm Jeffrey Bard, and I play Sir Simeon, the human sword mage. I'm Casey Smith, and I play Latchkey, a shard mine with the dual classes of Battlemind and Scion. And I'm Kelly Weissman Aspruth Jackson, the dungeon master. Also joining us this week is Josh Hall Bachner, who plays Ash, the Warforged Sorcerer, and who didn't get his intro in on time, and is thus getting publicly dragged. Oh, and as I mentioned last time, this episode is a bit short, sorry about that. We'll be back to our usual length next time. Now, let's get started. So to summarize where we are, the Brazen Ox, traveling by sea from the city of Greyhawk, in the Phineas to the city of Stormreach at the northern end of Gonduria, 
has suddenly, in the midst of a storm, run aground on a tropical island. Also, it's suddenly the middle of the day and the storm is gone. This tropical island appears to be one of an archipelago of islands where there's either a much larger island or a peninsula, again, hard to see, uh, not too far away, that is dominated by a massive volcano. There was, briefly, a interesting sort of light tower structure with a giant floating gem at the top of it, standing out in the water not too far away from where the ship is running aground on a beach. But that disappeared in a sort of ripply boop uh, <laughs> that gave everybody kind of a queasy or itchy feeling, depending on the nature of their bodies. Um, and the captain and the first mate are arguing rather loudly and aggressively. I just want to, I believe that no one speaks the language that they're arguing in. I just want to make sure. Can everyone confirm for me what languages their characters speak? I know Balmo is common and supernal. Um, yeah. And. Sarsimian is Baclinish, Common, Elvish. Elvish, Flanean, Draconic, Flanean. and Dwarven. Dwarven, yep. Uh, we just established that Ash is Common and Draconic. Then I believe Rakashi is Common and Goblin, is that right? Yes. As the, under, the, the sort of parlance of the underworld. And... Casey, uh, where did we leave it on latch uh, languages? Common and deep speech. Common and deep speech. All good choices. Uh, I did a, a. I think Balmo will try to at least say to your health or to life or whatever the in, in as many languages as he can as he can collect. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. So, would he recognize what language that they're they're speaking? Because he would have uh, attempted to. That, that's what Scowl was, was uh, the Scandinavian-ish. Ah, uh, I gotcha. Okay, uh, so if he had to guess, and and this is probably kind of obvious to the other characters, because, um, because I mentioned that um, Captain Evgor has this accent. He is speaking in the language that his accent comes from mm -hmm. right and that's that's pretty obvious even if you don't speak the person's language right like that, that's it seems more the native inflection uh, mm -hmm. sort of follows mm -hmm. and that would be i mean anybody would pretty much know that because he's it's evident that his accent derives from being a frost barbarian uh in the Thelonian peninsula which is way up in the northeast of the flaneus and what they speak there is sewell Hmm. So, so it seems that they are arguing in Seoul. Hmm. So when we uh, left off, Brayden had just rolled a one yes. on a religion check. Yeah, he sure had. Um, which we should get to, but before really anyone does anything, Rakashi just stomps up to the captain, knocks his ass down in the sand, holds a knife to his face, and says something along the lines of, do you want to tell me what is going on here? Or do you want to have some extra holes? Uh, let's resolve that. Balmo is processing the consequences of his one right now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he's going to take a little time with that. Uh, this is more immediate. So Rikashi pushes uh, Captain Evgor down into the sand um, of the by the, the now it's pretty evident once you're on the beach that the ship is basically wrecked. Like maybe it could be repaired, but it's not, it's not a small patch job. This thing is not going to be seaworthy anytime soon. Um, that Evgor is sort of, is still like sputtering and, and still very clearly angry with uh, Redigan, his first mate. But, but it was just, you know, it gets your attention when you're being threatened with a weapon um, and says, he steered us towards that tower. He, took us towards the tower and now we are here it is him hmm okay she gets up wheels on the first mate wait 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 like, wait, wait just wait. clocks first. him in the face <laughs> <laughs> so simeon sees what's going down and goes shit 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 um and then starts running over to rakashi i guess this is a beach right so it's like sand yeah so it's really yeah. awkward like he's kind oh, of yeah. like you know trying to move quickly but he can't quite um, but he's going to try to get in between them if he can 
when he gets an opportunity. Okay, um, so uh, Rikashi has just clocked Red against the first mate. Yes. Okay. Um, I will now check in with uh, with Balmo. So Balmo, you were trying to use your knowledge of religion to figure out where are we, right? Mm -hmm. That was the goal. And you rolled a one. On, on the assumption that we're on some other plane, mm -hmm. and with some worry that maybe I blasphemed and sent us all to the abyss, but like a really nice corner of the abyss. <laughs> so you are 100%, we are on another plane. You have no doubt in your mind. Okay. You are also 100%, it is all your fault. You mm -hmm. were blasphemed, you, have, you didn't listen to Mother Wharton enough. Uh, this is definitely on you. And you're 100% confident that where you are is the 88th layer of the abyss, what is known as Gaping Maw, the home mm -hmm. of Demogorgon. <laughs> which is a combination of tropical islands and the open stretches of sea full as teeming with monsters, just full of demons and terrible monstrous things. All right. Bomo's looking uncharacteristically ashen. <laughs> uh, he starts uh, wandering back down below decks to uh, to pour himself a glass. Uh, so Simi was racing over to where Rikashi is confronting Red against, right? Yeah. Anybody else doing something before we resolve that? Mm, no, I think Lachie is just sort of taking stock of the island, the state of the ship, and uh, sort of keeping an eye on all of what's going on, but since Sir Simeon seems to have that in hand, they'll kind of Leave it to them for the timing. Can I mark Rikashi? Uh, you mark just by designating within a range, right? It's like my nearest opponent or something. If you want to name one of the other PCs as your opponent, <laughs> you can mark Rikashi. That's definitely a thing you can do. All right. That's what I'm doing. I'm marking Rikashi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this was... It was much easier to cause inter intra party conflict than I thought it was. No, 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 no. This, there, there's a plan here. It's going to work out. It's going to be great. So, so while Ash is actively ignoring all of that nonsense, he would like to try to passively uh, learn anything that he can about the environment from, you know, the, the whatever magic or whatever he can sense. Um, I'm not quite sure. I guess that's an arcana check. Yeah. You want to, so you want to roll arcana. And so you're, your goal is just like what? Now, Talk I, me I, through what how what you think he's doing, and and be as be as uh, florid as you like. You get to so, decide how he works, right? So, so um, so the way that I'm thinking of this, yeah. uh, like I said, Ash has all of those thin golden lines that run along um, his surface, and my basic concept of that is that these are kind of like a smaller mirror of. The types of patterns that would be like the ar the arcane equivalent of like electromagnetism, right? Like the okay. world has an arc, mm. you know, not not quite ley lines because it's not like what's embedded in the ground exactly. It's more like what flows through the air and like suffuses the world, right? And so one of the things about the way that the um, relic folk are typically constructed is that they have these lines and that they mirror those patterns, and as a result, they can kind of perceive them to some degree. But kind of the mm -hmm. same way that you have like birds who can like follow the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. It'd be the same mm -hmm. thing here. Um, so normally that would just give you like for, for a lot of relic folk that would just kind of give you this <laughs> mild directional Bye. sense and maybe some awareness of weird things that are happening. But for someone who's trained in some of the arcane arts, uh, you can kind of read it a little bit more subtly and try to, um, you know, learn about you might be able to locate powerful sources of magic or uh, determine that something is unusual about the location or, or get a sense of like how far away you are from where you think because the, the fields have changed. So basically he's going to kind of stand there um, in some kind of like, you know, semi-meditative stance and try to like read, read the air. Okay, so he's, he's going to like really feel. So let me try and go around here. Casey, while Latchkey is looking around the ship and sort of scanning the the vicinity, right? Mm -hmm. 
they see at the tree line up the beach and a ways away, like not like right by the nearest. It's not like where you'd go if you were trying to get into the trees, but like way down the beach and over and inside the tree line. Mm -hmm. They clearly see at least one, maybe a couple of different large white shapes moving mm -hmm. among the trees. Okay. Um, that's for Latchkey. Uh, it's polar bears. So lost. marking is a great example of one of the things that's definitely abstract in this game. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I definitely have to tell you when you're marked. And yes. to some degree, your character has to have some consciousness of it. So I should tell you, Rakashi, that Sarsimian has marked you. How that how that awareness works, it's probably it probably comes down to something like it is it is somehow tangibly clear to you that Rika that Sarsimian is a threat. That is that that might look like drawing a sword, that might look like a, a a meaningful look, it might just be a shift in his stance, but his orientation towards you has moved from not threatening to threatening. Mm-hmm. Um, and remember that, that has implications for uh, it is harder to attack someone who is not your the person who marked you. Correct. Um, hmm. I assume that's part of his thinking. But uh, so that uh, Redigan is, I mean, he's not uh, he's not a statistically significant NPC. So. <laughs> You can push him around as much as you want. Um, he doesn't have a lot of resistance there. Uh, did did you have a question besides just hitting him? Uh, that was sort of the <laughs> prelude to questioning. But yeah, I, th I thought it was. I just wanted to make sure I hadn't missed it. Like, uh, if I n notice Sarsimian sort of coming in, I will let him good cop it. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Yes. So, like, I still want to seem very aggressive, but I am moving slowly enough that Sarsemian can intercede. Okay. So, we're making space for that. We'll get to, to that in your session then in a second. Josh, let's check in with you about that arcana roll. Did you roll the... 16. It's a 7 plus 9 for my various bonuses. Okay. Okay. Um, here's what you can tell. There is a bananas amount of magic going on here. Like, more than Ash has probably ever experienced. Is that fair? Mm, maybe not more in, in terms of more different sources, but there is some high-end stuff going on around you. During the brief period where Ash was aware of it before the tower disappeared, that was a big focal point of very intense magical energy. And then it was just gone. Like it wasn't there anymore. Also, when that happened, something, something bigger than just a tower disappearing changed because the entire orientation, your sense, the there's an innate sense of orientation kind of relative it wouldn't be to a magnetic pole but to something just to like sort of points of of it's probably a, a planar orientation actually like relative to you know the location of the astral sea and the elemental chaos and that kind of stuff uh that shifted when the tower disappeared so like something much bigger than just the tower going away it's more like the entire locality changed its location and the tower didn't happen to come with it so it would, oh, be, it would be fair for me to conclude, one, that it's still a very high magic uh, location even after that, but two, that the tower had some kind of like sp spatial or arcane like relationship to, to kind of the physical space such that like something about where we are or what's going on here is, is different with it gone, right? Like it's fair to kind of read into that, that whatever happened is related to that. And that the same sort of thing isn't happening actively again right now with a thought. There is absolutely, you can feel confident, confident about this, there's absolutely a connection 
between the orientation of wherever this is in kind of cosmic space and that tower. But what that relationship is, you definitely don't have good information on. Okay, so something shifted, but that's about as much as I can glean there. Yes, and I forgot to mention one detail about the tower, I'm sorry, uh, from uh, when I introduced it, which is that it was very clear because it's it, it's a big marking and there's no other markings on the tower. It's bare and unmarred on the surface, except that it has one big uh, numeral in Draconic. All of the writing systems have their own numeral systems. It was the numeral eight in Draconic, which again, several of the parties speak Draconic, so that's not hard for people to know. Um, okay, back to Sarsimian Rikashi. So, so Rikashi is slow rolling uh, her merciless beating of um, Redigant, uh, and that gives Sarsimian an opening if he wants to try and jump in and be good cop. Um, yeah, uh, is the beating actually happening? Uh, no, it was that first punch was really the sort of hello, I'm going to talk to you now, okay, of this conversation. Um, I can make an intimidate check if you would like, but beyond that, there is no further pummeling yet, okay? Yeah, since we are not like, um, I did not treat that as a legit attack, I'm not having you roll attack and damage and whatnot on yeah on, like I, I, you, we can change that if you want to oh no um, no that was that was that was a an interaction not an attack yeah i, I figured so that interaction does think does constitute an intimidate action so we'll go ahead and roll that and we'll just you know keep that in mind as we're playing things out but so go ahead and start simian with your action since Vinny um, yeah, essentially so left that opening for you sar simian then just kind of like runs up and he's got his hands up and he's like whoa 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 whoa, whoa. uh rakashi Things are okay here. I mean, this is this is this is a dire circumstance that we're in, and it's not. You know, we don't have to kill the guy. It's not. It's not necessary. We don't have to, but he's got some things to tell us, and let's just say I suggest that he does before killing becomes the good option. Well, I mean, if you just put the knife away, I'm sure this fine man will tell us all the things that we need to know from him, right? Oh, that's directed at Redian. Yeah. Uh, hmm. For the record, uh, my intimidate roll there comes out to a thirty-two. <laughs> Holy wow! Shit, it's, what is, okay. it is my strongest skill. Yeah. I rolled a nineteen, and we are level six. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I. Hang I, on, hang on. Since since I'm helping out with this kind of sorta, mm-hmm. uh, I would like to give him an additional plus five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because you have the, the yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh I didn't think it would cause as much trouble. I didn't think we'd run aground. I didn't I didn't think I thought we were just gonna come here, they take the cargo, and we'd be allowed to leave. I this is hey not man, let's let's be clear about something. Stories start at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Yes. While this is going on, I'm going to continue to actively ignore it, but instead I would like to go try to get the obelisk out of the hold of the ship if I can. Okay. If it's still here. Yes. So um, getting back down into the hold is easier than getting back up because falling is easier than levitating. (laughs) And then, so you can just jump down in the hold to get there. That's fine. Uh, And then you can start looking around for the box. It's in there with other cargo, but it's not impossible to find. Then there's getting it out of the hold, but now there's a big hole in the ship. So I think that's doable. It's going to be a, take a little bit, but it's doable. Yeah. You can start working I, on that project. I'm happy to slowly work on that and also to break and damage anything that I need to to get out. I have a 14 strength, so I'm not like the absolute worst at that. No, no. It's a- you'll probably pass Balmo at least once and you'll see him by his cask just with, with his with his elaborately painted stein just sort of taking a swig and saying balls 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 <laughs> at, 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 at one point he, he acknowledges ash and says i'm so sorry usually ash would be annoyed in this circumstance but something about uh the fact that he and balmo are the ones down here getting the things that are important and everybody else is having a dumb fight on the beach um, <laughs> leads him to have a, a little bit of gained respect and he's just going to kind of nod and shrug respectfully <laughs> uh so 
we're we're busily intimidating and, and interrogating uh, the first mate, Redigan Weemsnackle. Uh, he fiddles with his ring, that ring that Latchkey noticed earlier, yep. and says, I belong to a secret society. Just telling you about it, I'll be marked for death anyways. Rakashi just holds up the knife. Um, Latchkey, you're still looking around at the surroundings. Yeah. There um, is... No, go ahead. Oh, the pale shapes moving in the trees. Are those moving towards us or just sort of like ambling about in that direction? They look more ambling. Okay. It, it's possible that they're kind of watching through the trees, but they aren't moving towards you. And if anything, they're kind of moving around, shifting back and forth kind of at the edge of where they could be seen by you or or could see you. Okay, so then they'll kind of take note of that, but continue looking around. So that's, um, again, if the ship is facing east, and I'm not saying that it is, that's north up the beach. Okay. And further along that line, there's a gap, what appears to be the end of this island, and then... Uh, the start of what's it's very there's you know it's jagged coastline it's not really easy to tell what is an island what's an that's a peninsula um but it looks like it's probably connected to the larger island with the giant volcano um i should say actually that there's one giant volcano that dominates down there are actually a couple of other volcanoes or at least rises that could be volcanoes uh closer is the, is the by. volcano like active i mean is it smoking or does it look like it's no just no sort of hanging it, out it's there? just it has that cone shape that suggests right. that it's a volcano, right? It, it doesn't just look like a regular mountain, but it's not right. like erupting or actively smoking or anything. Okay. Um, so as I said, tracing the line of the beach and then crossing the water in the next place, the next, uh, probably the next island, there is a rocky outcropping at the edge of the beach. So like a place where um, this, this sort of, spit of rock is sticking up into the air uh, and mm-hmm. sticking right out of the water. And Latchkey sees a figure come up to the top of that, like must have climbed up or walked up the back of the rock and then gets to the peak of it and then the figure can be seen. Uh, it's a ways away, so it's hard mm-hmm. to say details with full certainty of this distance, but the figure looks to be about humanoid size and shape, you know, like somewhere in the six to seven foot height area Mm -hmm. um clad in some sort of very bulky armor it's extremely bright like very well polished silver much Mm -hmm. brighter and shinier than basically any conventional armor could be uh but it as they move it seems like it's cloth like it's it there's no uh there's no plating there's no segments or obvious straps it's just this sort of very shiny silver cloth material. It's very bulky. They're, they mm-hmm. look, they're moving in the way that looks like someone moves when they're wearing heavy armor. Um, and they're thick in a way that a being, a, a more normal sized shaped humanoid would be with a bunch of armor on top of them, right? I mean, there are humanoids that just are bulky at that level anyways, but it seems like the credible explanation is this is like an armored human or human-ish being. Mm -hmm. And then the helmet or the helm or whatever it is up top is just a uh, undifferentiated gold sphere. That's what's on top where the head is. There's no image on it. There's no detail on it. There's no obvious way of how it links to the rest of the body, except it's set on the body. Um, Mm -hmm. The whole thing is just very weird for its lack of seams and connecty bits. Okay. Um, how far away is this person as far as like, I don't know, like, like range, like I have a range of like five for. Oh, this person is dramatically out of, out of uh, combat range. This is like, you know, all of the stuff in this game is we're talking about matters of, uh, you know, things that are measured in yards, right? Okay. This would be, this would be miles uh, or at least approaching a mile, right? It's, it's way far away. Mm-hmm. Um, does the figure seem like it's just sort of hanging out up there or in the process of moving? 
Well, it stands on the rock. You're watching it, and it's clearly... I mean, it's not super easy to tell which direction it's facing, but it seems to have a front, and the front is pointed in the direction of of Mm y'all. So if you had to guess, you would say it was watching what was going on. It has something on like a strap slung over its shoulder. It's not really obvious Mm -hmm. what it is, but it's not making any particular aggressive moves. It's not really making any moves. It's just kind of standing there for the moment. Right. Um, Okay. So... Um, Lashky's actually going to head back to the ship to try and find, like, a telescope. Or a okay. Yeah. Uh, so Lashky's going to go back into the ship, look around for a... Um, a Far viewer of some sort. Magnifying yeah. glass. Yeah. I don't, yeah. don't think anyway, it's like a... Spyglass. Spyglass. Spy That's right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, back to the interrogation. Um, the uh, Redigant thinks, you know, like, clearly has is very torn about this situation. Very afraid, but also very torn about the situation. Hangs his head for a second, takes that ring off of his finger and says, I serve, or I served, the Chimera Project. As he says that, there's a deafening noise from, let's see, trying to picture the blocking on this. There's a deafening noise, and um, from back near the area of the ship, no one's really been looking at the ship. People have been either on the ship and looking out from it or been away from the ship and on the beach. Uh, But something has come up out of the water alongside the ship and would now like everyone's attention. Oh, no. There is a black with some brown modeling creature uh, about... Mm, right about 11 feet tall. Uh, it has a shape that's slightly like a frog, maybe, in terms of the shape of the body and the curvature of the mouth. But it has two legs that, it's, that it walks on. It walks upright. It has four tentacles, two on either side. It has... A lot of teeth in its mouth for a frog, obviously. I mean, the frogs don't usually have that. Um, and a really nasty-looking tongue that's as long or longer than either of its, any of its four tentacles and ends in sort of this, like, sucker pod, like a squid. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, it only... It doesn't have eyes on the side of its head, but it has this sort of stalk that comes up out of the top of the head that has three eyes in a cluster on top mm-hmm. of it. Um it's it's really gross looking and seems to have come up out of the ocean and it it will open uh with a really terrible roar towards where Sarsimian and Rikashi and Redigant and close by enough is Evgor are and so Armor class from Sarsimian and, uh, oh wait, is armor class another one? Let me just double check something. Ah, no, fortitude, please, from Sarsimian and Rikashi. Fortitude is 19? 16. Right, that's not a roll, it's just a static number. Yeah, it's just a static number. Yeah, 16. It's a static defense, just like AC. Um, okay. What happens? Tie goes to the attacker. So... Eight thunder damage to both of you. Mm. Mm. Hey, where am I putting my damage? I'm putting it on my character sheet. Yep. Uh, That causes uh, both Redigant and Evgor's ears to bleed profusely and they keel over in pain and and sort of just like go fetal at how uh, unpleasant that is. Well, that's not cool. No. No? I would like to join this fight. All right, so let's say we are going to resolve this combat, but I want to just move a couple of other things forward first, and then we'll we'll do this properly uh, at the start of the next episode. So, um, Josh, and and, yep. and just remind me how big is this thing? I, I kind of lost. It is a large monster, which means that it takes up four squares rather than one, and it's t- I get its height at about eleven feet. Eleven feet. feet. Yeah, so it's like ogre-ish scale-wise. Yeah, the scale is comparable to an ogre. That's another large monster, yep. 
So Josh, uh, Ashlar was trying to get to the obelisk. The obelisk is pretty findable. Um, mm -hmm. And he's just going to try and move it out of the ship, right? Yep. Okay, so uh, he's gotten a hold of the obelisk. He's moving the, or at least the box of the obelisk is in. Uh, he's moving it out. The hole in the ship would take him like right behind this thing. Okay. Um, anything else from Balmo or Latchkey before we close? Uh, as soon as it's apparent that something else is going on, Balmo assumes, oh, this is a demon. I've got just the thing for that. <laughs> and he's going to make his way up uh, above deck and get eyes on. Uh, the other passengers, by the way, uh, are also, well, at least, yeah, the other passengers are, are at least coming out to see what's going on and maybe some of them to see if they can help. Um, so that's in motion. Uh, almost sort of entering the fray. Latchkey, anything from you? Um, so can I say that Latchy finds a spyglass or do I, is that like? Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm All happy. right. So uh, Latchy finds a spyglass, I would say, in the moments before this thing erupts out of the water and swings it, you know, puts it up to their eye and swings it as if they're going to go get a better look at this um, person mm -hmm. in strange armor standing on the um, mountain. But then everything kind of shakes and the spy guest swings around instead and basically just gets a whole lot of three eyes on a stock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. So they close the spy glass, sort of put it in their rucksack and it's not really a sigh because there's not, they don't really do air, but there's just sort of a like, like the glow in their body just sort of brightens and dims in a similar fashion and they jump from the deck to the sand. And This is why we get along, because we both sigh in light. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Cool. This All is right. The only reason why lungs would be useful is the expression of frustration is much harder mm -hmm. without them. Oh, but, this, but this is a, a sigh, sigh. Mm. Right. Oh. Hey. Oh. Wow. Oh. That hurt that me a so little bit, but I commend you. <laughs> Respect. All right. So we will yeah. join combat at the start of the next episode. All right. All right. That we can get to a, a little bit more incrementally further mm -hmm. on uh, whatever is going on this, in this crazy island. This will yeah. give us a lot more to wonder about <laughs> while we wait to do our next yeah. game. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? I If you have a minute, Josh, I can say a little bit of something about um, my intent sure. with this game because I've a little bit, so I said I've, I've been preparing some things to say to you. So, uh, my intent is you are not stuck here, you can leave. It's just hard. Mm -hmm. There are some ways I've already thought of that you could get, get home. And you're also, if you come up with ideas that are as good or better than mine, I will incorporate those. So, there's it is this is not like there are no rails, I'm not keeping you on this crazy island. But so it's it's not just season one of Lost. It's also seasons <laughs> <laughs> three and onward of Lost. Yeah. It, if you guys decide really hard, we don't want to play Lost. We want to go back to Greyhawk. You can get back to Greyhawk. There's stuff we can do in Greyhawk. I'm fine with that. Um, but there is a lot to explore on the island. The island is a real ecosystem, uh, which has some consequences. One of those things is that it's full of things that don't necessarily match your level so i'm going to try and give you as much signaling as i can when like this is a thing that you probably want to run away from um <laughs> as opposed to confront so just don't i don't don't assume that just because you've met the monster that means that i've carefully tailored it to be matched to your level i am not doing that mm -hmm. um if i throw the monster at you that's sort of different but if you just if you go out and and hunt down a problem that doesn't necessarily mean the problem is going to be suited to your character level so we should watch the zoning. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, as I said, it's a real ecology. There are things that are going to be unfolding while you do whatever you're doing. So the, you know, the you will find in time that there are multiple issues you could be dealing with. And if you, how you prioritize those will affect the, you know, like we're going to address this first. Great. You're addressing that first, but the other things are going to still be unfolding in the background. Mm -hmm. Um 
It's very much intended to be a sandbox. I want to follow what the players are interested in, the characters are particularly interested in pursuing. Um, I have lots of stuff, but I'm not like, okay, and then we'll next game we will proceed to this next thing. We're going to spend some time in between, not so much this time, but some time in between games doing things like plotting out, okay, this is what you're interested in, this is what you want to explore. Like, um, I will tailor it to you rather than me deciding, and now you're going to have this adventure because I just, I've decreed it. Um, yeah, I hope it'll be a fun game of exploration. I'm excited. Into it so far. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Oh. I will probably have um, mm -hmm. a, a couple of questions about uh, specifically magic stuff, mm -hmm. given that we have a little bit more context about like where the game is going to take care of. So I'll yeah. um, or take place. So I'll, I'll probably bug you about those before we play next. Oh, and there's one special rule that I wanted to introduce after we'd started playing, which is especially because we spend all this time on character backstory and we've built up stuff that we may or may not use. Right? It's entirely possible you can return to Greyhawk. That's fine, but you also may not, and that's also okay. I want to give you an opportunity to use some of that backstory stuff that we otherwise might not touch. So there's an extra way you can stunt in this game by giving me facts about your character that we didn't know yet. Hmm. So basically like, oh, so you can, you can use some kind of like new minor revelation about their history or their identity or their relationships to each other like hey remember when we did this thing that we haven't talked about before but we have that in our as a shared experience in our past and that will give you a bonus stunt level when you do it hmm. huh. sadly i think lost has taught us that you should never do a flashback about how you got your tattoos so that's <laughs> hopefully uh your tattoo story is better than jack's stupid ass tattoos it would be hard not to be <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that's that's the things that I wanted to cover, and mm -hmm. I'm sure if you have more questions, I'll be happy to uh, to try and explicate them later. All right, okay. well, we'll bounce. Awesome. Say bye bye, Nate. Bye, 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 Nate. bye, Nate. bye. bye Nate. That's it this week for the Chimera. Our theme music is "Hoof, Heart, and Hiss" by Matt Weber. You can find a link to more of Matt's work in the show notes. You can also find us online at thechimera.space or on Twitter and Facebook at ChimeraPod. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or just telling your friends. Join us back here in two weeks for the next episode, and thanks for listening! free air to talk about your beer oh yes uh welcome to Balmo's beer corner uh today i have a left hand brewing company milk stout nitro uh it's uh it recommends you pour hard to get the nice you know uh guinness style head with the cascade of uh bubbles and that's very pretty uh it's it's a nice you know it's a fairly strong beer, but it's very smooth because it's a milk stout. I I like it. It's not my favorite, but maybe we'll do my favorite next time. All right. The end. Yay. Go ahead and add in like a little MIDI, you know, <laughs> roll out the barrel for this segment or something. <laughs> anyway. <laughs>